It's 1788. You've stolen a piece of bread and got caught. You're given two options, hanging or a free cruise. What do you pick? Well, first of all, you can't pick, and second of all, it's not exactly a cruise. Today's topic is British floating prisons. What were they, how did they come to be, and why? But this story actually begins across the globe in America. You see, up to this point, America had become the solution to a little problem that Britain was having. Unlike America, Britain was getting a little cramped, Population was rising and urban centres crowding up. And with larger populations came more crime. There was no national prison system at this point, and only very small, very crowded prisons. Someone came up with the great idea that if we have too many criminals, why don't we just send them away somewhere else? Out of sight, out of mind. So even in its infancy, as the New World colonies were developing, they began shipping convicts over to help and contribute as forced labour, but also just to get them out of the way. Rather than rehabilitation or imprisonment, this system relied upon pure separation from society, putting people on ships and sending them away from family, friends, and the only home they've ever known to what would feel like a whole other world. This became known as transportation. And when I say the word convict, we tend to picture people who would be in prison nowadays. But in reality, that wasn't necessarily the case. Only a small amount of these prisoners would be charged for violent offences. In fact, convicts could include simple pickpockets and other minor crimes committed by desperate, impoverished people who had very little in the first place. Children were also often sent for transportation and likely a high percentage were falsely accused of something. For over half of those given transportation sentences, it was the very first offence. This is in part thanks to new laws known as the Bloody Code, which listed over 200 crimes punishable by death in 1776. Imprisonment for theft and robbery only grew, it might have felt too much to punish these offences by death, so transportation somehow seemed like a better option. In fact, the three most popular type of crimes punishable by transportation, theft, typically by the urban poor, rebellion against the king, typically by Irish and Scottish immigrants, and violent crimes. So picture Oliver Twist, an Irish rebel and a murderer, crowded together in the hull of a ship. The worst thing is, these convicts were sentenced to terms of transportation, almost like a prison term. But once your term was up, you weren't sent back home for free. And keep in mind they couldn't just buy another plane ticket home. This was in a time when a trip across the ocean was six months long, and there would be little chance they would ever be able to return home. From 1718 to 1775, 44,000 convicts were sent to the American colonies. Now, this all came to an end with the American Revolution. By 1783, the British had officially lost its colony over in America, and so had nowhere to ship all of these convicts off to. So despite nowhere to transport them, the Old Bailey in England continued doling out this punishment to around two-thirds of its convicts. And this created a bit of a bottleneck situation of literal floating prisons along England's southern coast naval ports. This was known as the Hoax Act of 1776, a temporary solution that was in place for 12 years. Hoax were decommissioned ships, and the only ships large enough to house so many human lives. Nothing like a cruise ship of today, but former slave ships and cargo ships. So you can imagine they weren't the most luxurious accommodation. Convicts began to be given hard labour jobs on the docks and harbours to put them to use. Conditions were horrid, food was scarce, and spirits were kept desperately low. The hulks were also privately owned by companies, and it wasn't until 1802 a government-appointed inspector would be employed to oversee conditions. Now these hulks all mostly held men. In fact, there was only one ship designated for women only. The Hawks Act actually stipulated that women would be placed in houses of correction doing manual labour, as they were unfit for the heavy labour that they were having the men do. 
But this didn't apply to children. Boys between the ages of 11 to 19 accounted for 10% of the inmates. And young boys as young as 8 could find themselves stuck right in there with fully grown men. It wasn't until 1825 when they created a separate hulk just for young boys. But that didn't necessarily improve their conditions. It was only in 1838 that, legally, juvenile offenders began being treated any differently from fully grown adults, being placed in specific prisons for their own rehabilitation. It became quite obvious that this wasn't a great solution, especially when convicts began easily escaping from these ships to swim ashore. Transportation picked back up with the decision to start sending convicts to their new uncolonised colonies in Australia. However, these hulks stuck around for a long time still. With the bottleneck created, the convicts often had to spend a waiting period until transport could be arranged. Many of the transported criminals, therefore, were released after serving their entire term on a ship. Seeing multiple large ships docked in harbour was a common sight in many popular parts of the late 18th century. Eventually the popularity of transportation sentence died out and Britain began to focus on building and expanding prisons on land. Britain's last prison ship was decommissioned all the way back in 2005. This ship was called the Ware. It was bought in 1997 to ease overcrowding in jails, which sounds rather familiar. It was docked in Portland and proved a good boost to employment and the economy but also had a lot of complaints from the prisoner and staff. The wear suffered from a shortage of fresh air, light, exercise space and any constructive work for the prisoners to do. And many compared it to the system of the Hulk prisons back in the Victorian period. I can assure you it was nowhere as near as bad as in 1780. But it is interesting to see the prison service was attempting this system once more, just 20 years ago. Though these Victorian prison ships have now disappeared, one permanent mark they did leave was tied with the colonisation of Australia. Thanks for tuning in. Times definitely have changed, and even though this wasn't the most glamorous part of history, it is still worth learning about. Tune in next time to learn about Australia's beginnings as a penal colony.